So happy to have you along once again. We are joined as always by Greg Engert, beer director for the Neighborhood Restaurant Group of Food and Wine Sommelier of the Year. The group including Rustico, two locations in Alexandria and Ballston, also Columbia Firehouse in Old Town. The uh, 2012 uh, is winding down. It's been a good one. I've been happy to spend some time with you talking Absolutely. about delicious beers. So thank you again. Got it. What's on tap this week? So this week uh, we are doing... A brand new collaboration beer, um, and the last collaboration beer for Stone Brewing Company of 2012. Um, Stone has uh, lots of, of limited, kind of occasional releases that come out throughout the year, in addition to their amazing core products. Um, and uh, it seems like you know every couple months or so we get two, maybe three of these really cool releases. Uh, this month we saw the release of The Perfect Crime, which is what we'll talk about today, but also Vertical Epic 12 12 12, um, which is their, uh, the last in the series that they started in 2002 with 020202. Uh, each year they were releasing a different ageable beer um, to be consumed fresh, but also to be laid down to see how it kind of matured and evolved over time. And so every time they did this, of course, they would come out on the particular date. Um, so February 2nd, 2002 began it, December 12th, 2012 ended it and so they just kind of finish up that series uh, it's a phenomenal beer and that's also available right now so definitely look out for that uh, along with this they released uh, one of their collaborations their, their last of 2012 and I, I think we've mentioned before when Stone does collaborations they do uh, um, three breweries together so Stone plus two this one stands out as different than the ones they've done in the past um, in some ways because it involves two of the gypsy brewers that we talk about um, a lot and that's actually kind of indicated by the fact that it's called The Perfect Crime. Because Stone here is working with Evil Twin, uh, Yeppe, uh, Jarnit Bierkso, um, from Copenhagen originally, now living in, in, in New York, New York City. And Stillwater Artisanal, uh, which is Brian Strumke's uh, gypsy concern from Baltimore originally. What a grouping. Yeah, I know, it's great. <laughs> Some three and heavy so, hitters. Yeah, and so when Stillwater and Evil Twin have done beers together in the past, they've gone under the moniker of The Perfect Crime. So... They're kind of continuing that here with a third partner, and that's the inimitable Stone Brewing Company from Escondido, uh, California. And, it, and Mitch Steele, who's the, the brewmaster at Stone, uh, made note that this is kind of a, a fitting thing um, to work with the gypsies in some ways, because the very first collaboration beer that, um, that Stone ever did was with Ale Smith out of San Diego as well, but also with uh, Mee Keller, which is the kind of the original gypsy brewer. Uh, they did that beer in 2008. And that was uh, Mee Keller, of course, Mikkel borg Bjergso, who is Yeppa's evil twin, his, uh, his brother. So they kind of, they, they've worked with Mikkel before, and now they're working with two more uh, gypsies. And uh, this beer is phenomenal. Um, it is, they're calling it a sort of black smoked Cezanne. And um, I have to be honest, when I first heard that, I was a, a little concerned just because uh, it seems that nowadays um, smoke in beer is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, and sometimes it can overwhelm, especially more delicate flavors like those created by the fermentation of a farmhouse yeast, a Cezanne yeast. Um, but uh, having tasted it already, it is beautifully balanced. The, the, they're using um, some um, oak smoked wheat malt, which lightens the beer up and uh, gives it a little bit of a, a touch of the smoky quality, but nothing uh, overwhelming uh, at all. Then obviously some other roasted malts to give it this great kind of dark complexion. Uh, so little hints of coffee and chocolate and things like that. And then really the only thing that stays on about this is the yeast that's employed, which is a uh, Belgian farmhouse yeast that'll generate cool kind of earthy, grassy, and peppery notes uh, as well. Okay. Without further ado. That's right. The, the, the nose tips you off that it's a Saison style. Yeah, it does. You see, and that's a cool thing. You do get some of that kind of bright floral peppery notes coming through, but also working nicely with the, the like slightly roasted peppery qualities of the malt. That's real nice. Isn't that good? Yes. It's dry, and you see that the, the smoke comes through in the finish, but it's, it's kind of teasing it out and almost has a tannic quality to it, but never overwhelming. Um, it's um, absolutely just delicious. And beer. it lingers nicely, yeah, too, it's a lot as, of, a, um, as it sort of, as you enjoy the, the end of the taste. Yeah, it's, it's, very it's cool because it's, it's actually 
a little bit lighter on the palate, which is great. You know, it's about 6.8%. So the body here is not overwhelming for what you'd expect from a Saison, but that body lingers so nicely that it, it, it's, it's full in its finish, which is excellent. I have to imagine, and I could be completely wrong, that a two brewery collaboration, the way they go about it, must be different by just virtue of the math, different than a three brewery collaboration. Is it? I mean, but it, maybe yeah. it's just the same. Or it's there, the same, is just there a just bigger more voice of a challenge? No, no, no. no. Okay. I think the cool thing about craft brewers when they do collaborations is, and you know, this is speaking from Blue Jacket, and we've done uh, 14 collaborations so far in anticipation of opening Blue Jacket in DC next year. Right. So having done so many now, the great thing is that you're, you're doing collaborations with your friends, the people that you know, and what you find is two heads or three heads or four heads are always better than one. And what I, th I think is the best thing about collaboration is when you start talking about what you want to do, when you, by the time you get to the end, the best collaborations show you a beer that would not have happened by, by any of the three on their own. You know, it's something that only could have happened if the three or two or four or whatever had actually come together. So um, it's, and that's one of the best things about about collaborations. I think, at least for me personally, from a marketing standpoint, it's attractive to me. I look at it and I see names of two breweries. Maybe I only know one, but I really like that brewery. So I say, oh, I'm going to try that. Absolutely. Whereas otherwise you might pass it right on by. You and just, you're, you... you're absolutely, that's it. What's interesting to me about that is there's this kind of, you know, we're always talking about how breweries are, all breweries, be they relatively big, like Stone or really teeny tiny, are making more and more occasional beers. Um, and so this is great because we, as consumers, do like to try th new things all the time. Um, and typically, when they're occasional, they're scarcer as well. So automatically, you see something you've not had, um, you don't see much of it, you kind of already want it. And then if uh, the brewer attached to it is somebody you like, then you definitely want it. But then if, if it's two or three brewers that you like, you have to have it. So it's, uh, it, from the marketing standpoint, it works out really well. We've gotten a few questions for Greg over the past few weeks. If you have a question, we invite you to email it in. I'll give you that email in a moment. Um, I had to transfer the emails from my Beer of the Week email account onto the notes in my iPad, and I somehow cut off this person's name. So I apologize. I'll put it right down here. Uh, but it's quick questions. He picked up a bottle recently of a Baia de saint uh, Abbe uh, de saint Bonchien. Okay, yeah, I wasn't from, anywhere close. It's from the Brasserie Franche Montaigne uh, okay. in Switzerland. Yep. I'll, I'll put the name up on the bottom here, too. Uh, 2006 vin vintage, blended in April 2007. And he's wondering, how much longer or should he save a bottle like this, and what's the ideal serving temperature? So, um, there's many different kinds of styles of beer that will age gracefully, um, you know, Imperial stouts, really intense Belgian strong dark ales are two that come to mind, of course, English barley wines. Um, when it comes to those three, um, I've had, well, actually, barley, I've had them all aged for, you know, over 10 years and, and enjoyed them a lot. Um, but the other um, styles that age very, very well uh, are what Abbé de Saint-Bonchien is, and that's um, sour beers. Um, and just like with, you know, certain Rieslings that lay down for a very long time, they have such high acidity that this is kind of the backbone that provides a great possibility for aging for a long time. And, um, and, and so Abbé de Saint-Bonchien is, is vintage dated for a reason. It does lay down extremely well. Okay. Um, I've had recently a bottle of, of, this, of this vintage, uh, which was brewed in 2006, but bottled in 2007. Um, and it's, what it is, Abbé de Saint-Bonchien is amazing. At uh, one time... Um, uh, it was called the, the best beer in the world by the New York Times um, and the wine writer there. But it is an outstanding blend of strong sour red ales aged in a number of different oak barrels. When you drink it fresh, it's vibrantly acidic and delicious. Over time, some of that acidity will mellow and you'll get a kind of uh, a, a nuanced complexity that wasn't there to begin with, some cool kind of oxidized notes coming in and things like that. So uh, it's hard to say should he open it or not. I think it's got a lot... It can go on longer and longer, um, but at the same time, it is tasting fantastic right now. Right now. Like what I would say with like certain beers like um, Imperial Stouts, Barrel Age Stouts, things like that, I typically cut those off around four or five years. I, I mean, they, they can still probably keep going, but for me, I've had great success in, in that time period for those. But with Sours, you'd be surprised. They can last for an, an incredibly uh, long time. And let me just mention before I get to the serving tap, 
when you are aging um, beer, a uh, few things are hugely important. One, of course, is it needs to be a cool, dark place. You know, you want it somewhere between, you know, 45 and 55 degrees or 40 and 55 degrees. Um, not next to your cactus in the windowsill? Not, not right there. Oh. No, no sunlight oxidizing it or, or skunking it or anything like that. So you want to keep it aside. Um, it's good to have a somewhat higher humidity level, especially if it's a corked bottle, just so it keeps its shape. Um, if it gets too dry in the area, like in a refrigerator, for instance, um, it, the, the cork will dry out and you can get um, infections and oxidation increase and things like that. So dark, cool, good amount of humidity. Um, and always stand your beers up when you age them. Um, you, know, you know, we lay down wine on its side, but uh, for beer, typically beers that we age are re-fermented in the bottle. Typically they're not completely filtered, and so they have lots of sediment. And that sediment increases over time. So if you leave a beer on its side for five years, sometimes that sediment can cake so hard onto the side of the glass that when you pour it, no matter how much you try to decant it and leave it out, you're going to have some floaties entering into um, your beer. And also, you could make a case that uh, when it's on its side, you get more oxygen surface area that could leak in, um, and you could oxidize the beer a little bit quicker. So stand up, dark, cool, uh, relatively high humidity. Uh, and then as far as serving, um, a beer like Gabay de Saint-Bon Chien, I love that beer um, right around 50 degrees, 50 to 52 degrees. Um, Coldness accentuates acidity. So if you serve something like that really cold, it's going to taste more sour than it is. It's going to kind of freeze up your palate, and it's going to hold back all the amazing nuanced volatile aromatic compounds that exist in the beer. So giving it a little bit of, of warmth, you're going to mellow out the tartness a bit, and you're going to kind of rev up the volatiles so that they can pop out of the glass. You're kind of creating evaporation so that the aromas are much stronger than they would be at a cooler temp. Okay. If you've got a question for Greg, the email is beeroftheweek at WTOP.com. Greg, we thank you as thank always. Thank you very much. It's been a great 2012. Thank you for that as well. Everyone, please always do drink responsibly, and be sure to bring your thirst next time for another Beer of the Week.